Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Mengay International Museum. I'm Rob Seidner. I'm director of Mengay International, and it is a pleasure to have all of you here today. We are very happy to be hosting this event. This is not our event. It's the event of the San Diego Foundation, the Center for Civic Engagement, and the program of our sister colleague here in the park, um, Micah Parson, and the San Diego Museum of Man, with whom we're really pleased to be collaborating. This museum, and I hope you know it already, if you don't, the museum will be open until 6 o'clock tonight. And those of you who don't feel the need to rush right off to the reception uh, can uh, go upstairs and, uh, and on this floor and discover more about this museum. Uh, we call ourselves a museum of folk art, craft, and design. Uh, but all of that is focused on the arts of daily life, what we call the arts of the people, or what the founder, the man who coined the word minge, uh, used to describe as um, beautiful objects made by the many for the many, rather than by the few for the few. So I hope you will discover on this level, uh, right here in this theater gallery, um, wonderful Kenti cloth from our collection, uh, prestige cloth of Ghana, and out in the main gallery, also from Ghana, from West Africa, Asafo flags. These are entirely from our own collection, as is everything upstairs at the, this time, too. Uh, so it's showing how beautifully our collection is growing. Uh, now 195 countries of the world are represented in it with um, about 26,000 objects. Upstairs, you'll also find in our permanent bead gallery uh, a current selection of beads and beaded objects from the entire continent of Africa. Out front in the niche is uh, our number of wonderful objects from Ethiopia. So that has been our focus this year on the great continent of Africa. As well, upstairs, you can see uh, Minge of Japan, treasures new and old from the museum's collection across the rest of the upper level. So come back soon, come back often. Thank you for being here today. Thank you so much, Rob. It's such a pleasure to be here today in this beautiful Minge International Museum. Thank you all for coming. Good afternoon, I'm Bruna Mori, the San Diego Foundation Center for Civic Engagement Manager. And we're so pleased to see all of you, donors, electeds, board members, advisory council members, all of you advocates, all of you friends. So thank you so much for joining us for Race, Are We So Different? in partnership with the San Diego Museum of Man. Tours of the exhibition and a reception will follow just across the way, so please do join us. So a quick survey, I'm, I'm curious, so how many of you are here with nonprofits or the public sector? Raise your hand, please. Wow, fantastic. Um, business, a couple of business, okay. Um, academics, either educators or students. Okay, a fairly good mix, a lot of nonprofits and, and academics in the audience today. We're really happy to see that diversity because at the Center for Civic Engagement, we're really committed to creating a space where the entire community can come together and discuss the challenges and opportunities that matter to all of us to create a more vibrant San Diego region. Uh, the Future 40 series in particular is very much interested in, in asking those very provocative questions and, and challenging our assumptions. And we're really honored today to have someone who's willing to challenge those assumptions, very provocative, Dr. Sharis Kubrin, um, who is a UC, UC Irvine professor of criminology and also the author of Privileged Places. Um, Dr. Kubrin is going to discuss how race, place, and opportunity or inopportunity are connected, especially in our most underserved communities. Um, she writes, the fact that place and race exert such a profound impact on one's future, or whether there will even be a future, violates accepted notions of fair play. I think that's very important. 
It's also important to note that for 40 years, the San Diego Foundation has been very committed to promoting philanthropy and civic engagement throughout San Diego region to improve the quality of life for all San Diegans. And we believe that improving the lives of our most vulnerable populations will create more opportunity for more people and more access that contributes overall to the prosperity of our region. So Dr. Kubrin's 25 minute talk will be followed by a conversation with moderator, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> we have a new moderator tonight and that is Jess Jolette. Um, and she is with Pillars of the Community, and we look forward to having a conversation with her in around how race, violence, and the intersection of music, culture, and social identity intersect. Um, it's n one more thing I wanted to mention to you. We're really thrilled to have both of you, and we're really thrilled to have all of you, and we're hoping you'll help us out. Um, we want to raise awareness about the constructs of race and opportunity. So if you don't mind tweeting out to your networks any insights or key learnings from this evening um, at hashtag Future40SD, it's up there on the screen. We'd be very appreciative. Okay, so and now it is my honor to introduce Dr. Sharis Kubrin, Professor of Criminology, Law, and Society at UC Irvine. Her award-winning TED Talk addresses the use of rap lyrics as evidence in criminal trials against young men of color. In 2005, Dr. Kubrin received the Ruth Schonle Kavan Young Scholar Award from the American Society of Criminology and the Morris Rosenberg Award for Recent Achievement from the District of Columbia Sociological Society. In 2014, she received the University of California, Irvine, School of Social Ecology Dean's Diversity Research Award and the American Society of Criminology Division on People of Color and Crime Kwame Ritchie Mann Award. In addition to privileged places, race, residence, and the structure of opportunity, she has authored dozens of books and scholarly publications. Please warmly welcome Dr. Sharis Kubrin. Should your art send you to prison? A few years ago, when I was asked to be an expert witness on a criminal case involving an aspiring rapper, this is the very question I asked myself. Back in 2011, I was contacted by a defense attorney who had come across a paper of mine titled Gangsters, Thugs, and Hustlers, Identity and the Code of the Street in Rap Music. And in this paper, I had conducted a content analysis of over 400 gangster rap songs, identifying whether themes like violence and misogyny were present in the lyrics. This defense attorney wanted to know if I'd be willing to serve as an expert witness in a criminal case involving his client, Olutosin Oduwale, who was charged with communicating a terrorist threat. What had happened was, back in 2007, Oduwale's car ran out of gas, forcing him to abandon it on the campus of Southern Illinois University Edwardsville, where he was a college student. And when authorities searched his car, among the many things they found was a piece of paper in the car's center console, which they referred to during the trial as the note. Now, on one side of the note were Oduwale's rap lyrics. And I won't, you can't read them there, but that's just lyrics that he had penned. And on the other side of the note were more rap lyrics that were followed by six lines of text upon which the entire case rested. And the six lines of text were, Glock to the head of, send $2 to a PayPal account. If this account doesn't reach $50,000 in the next seven days, then a murderous rampage similar to the VT, the Virginia Tech shootings, will occur at another highly populated university. This is not a joke. Well, as you can imagine, when police found this note, they immediately got a search warrant to search Otawale's campus apartment, where they found binders of notebooks filled with his violent and misogynistic rap lyrics. And they also found a handgun. Turns out that the handgun was legally acquired, but it was forbidden in a campus dorm. The police combined these two sets of evidence and charged Odawale, a college student with no prior criminal convictions, with attempting to communicate a terrorist threat. 
Now, Odawale copped to the gun possession charges. He says, I'm guilty of those. But he adamantly denied that he was a terrorist planning to carry out acts of violence. He claimed and maintained that the, lo that the notes, the six lines of text, were simply ideas that he had jotted down for a new rap song that he was working on, essentially the beginning stages of a rap song. Now, I reviewed this preliminary evidence, and I remember back in, this was the, early, the, the, the late 2000s, thinking, oh, this doesn't look good. This guy seems pretty guilty. But I reminded myself, as a professor of criminology, as well as a rap music scholar, that I needed to withhold judgment until all the evidence had been reviewed. So when Odawale went to trial in 2011, I set to reviewing that evidence, which included, among other things, spiral-bound notebooks that were filled with literally hundreds and hundreds of pages of Odawale's rap lyrics. He was a serious aspiring rapper, very prolific. What I wanted to do was content analyze these lyrics to provide a well-informed opinion about these six lines of text. So after months of content analyzing the lyrics, I produced a lengthy report, which I submitted to the court, and then I was called on to testify. And during my testimony, I tried to do a lot of things. One thing I tried to do was explain to the jurors, most of whom I think had never heard of rap music, let alone gangster rap, what rap music and gangster rap music is. And I explained that, that gangster rap is a style of rap music, a subgenre of rap music that originated in South Central Los Angeles that by definition features aggressive and confrontational lyrics that are meant to kind of shock the listener. And these lyrics tend to focus on themes like violence and misogyny. I provided evidence from the notebooks that Odawale was indeed an aspiring gangster rapper. I then argued it was predictable that his lyrics would be extremely violent and that the content of his lyrics would match what we see in gangster rap songs more generally. Things like portraying a violent persona, being prepared to use violence if necessary, the glorification of guns, and so on. Finally, I testified on the lyrical processes involved in creating rap music, noting, for example, that lyrics can reflect different stages of creative development. So not all lyrics rhyme or flow necessarily. And often lyrics are written on random pieces of paper or whatever is available at the time an idea strikes. And I finally explained to the jurors some common poetic devices that rapper use, including things like intros or outros, or unrhymed spoken words that are meant to either introduce or conclude a song and make a shocking statement or often draw the listener in. And in making each point to the jurors, I provided numerous examples from Odawale's notebooks. He had so much there, I was able to really provide lots and lots of examples. I then rendered my final opinion that the six lines of text written on a random piece of paper found in Odawale's car do represent, in fact, the beginning stages of rap lyrics, or perhaps could be an intro or an outro to a rap song that he was working on. Jury was not convinced. After deliberating less than three hours, they declared Odawale guilty, and he was sent off to prison. Now, since then, the criminalization of rap lyrics has continued unabated, including right here in San Diego. Meet local rapper Brandon Duncan, otherwise known as, to his fans as Tiny Do. In 2014, Duncan, much to his surprise, found himself in jail awaiting charges, oh sorry, waiting trial on charges that he conspired to commit a series of gang-related shootings in the San Diego area. Charges that could have landed him in life, in prison for life. While admitting that he did not shoot the gun or drive the getaway car or even have knowledge about these shootings, the prosecutors elected to use other evidence to prove Duncan's guilt. His rap lyrics. Arguing he profited from the shootings through his gangster rap album, No Safety, the district attorney's office charged Duncan, who had no prior criminal record, under 182.5 of the California Penal Code, which states that anyone who, quote, willfully promotes, furthers, assists, 
or benefits from felonious criminal conduct by a gang is guilty of conspiracy to commit that felony. In essence, prosecutors wanted to put Tiny Do on trial for his rap lyrics. Now, eventually the charges were dropped, but only after Duncan had spent eight years behind bars. Now, Odawale's and Duncan's cases are not statistical anomalies. There are literally dozens and dozens of other examples of cases that I could share with you if I had the time, including many cases that I've testified in or consulted on. And in fact, literally, as I was driving down today from UC Irvine to give this talk, I was contacted by a San Diego attorney asking me if I'd be willing to be a, a, a consultant on a case involving an aspiring rapper in rap lyrics. My point is that this is not an isolated practice. In fact, in my research, I have uncovered over a hundred of these cases occurring across the United States. And what's so crazy is that it's virtually unheard of for musicians outside of rap to have their lyrics introduced as evidence against them in criminal trials. So we don't see this for punk, we don't see this for rock, not even for heavy metal. Over the last few years, I have publicized these research findings and recently wrote two amicus briefs to educate the Supreme Court justices about gangster rap for rap lyrics cases, one of which was heard by the US Supreme Court. I've also been trying to raise awareness about this, this practice. In addition to writing op-eds in major outlets like New York Times and the Los Angeles Times, CNN, Forbes, I've been trying to give talks in a variety of contexts to raise awareness. As just one example, I gave a TEDx talk on the use of rap lyrics as evidence in criminal trials that was recently awarded a Cicero Speechwriting Award in the category of controversial or highly politicized topic. Now despite all of this, it's become clear to me that this practice is in fact on the rise. The movement to criminalize rap lyrics, in my opinion, reflects a broader effort to redefine the meaning of rap music. Rather than treat rap as a form of artistic expression that's used primarily to entertain, and entertain lots of people, um, you know, throughout the United States, the world in fact, prosecutors are arguing and convincing judges and juries alike that the lyrics are actually autobiographical confessions of illegal behavior. In other words, prosecutors are arguing that the lyrics, that rappers are confessing to crimes in the lyrics. Or they're arguing that the lyrics provide evidence of a defendant's knowledge, motive, or identity with respect to an alleged crime. Now the problem with this from my standpoint as a scholar who studies rap music is that the fictional characters portrayed in rap are often a far cry from the true personality of the artists themselves. The near universal use of stage names within rap music is the clearest signal that rappers are fashioning a character. Yet the first person form, that, the narrative form that rap music takes, and rappers claims that they're keeping it real, that is providing authentic accounts of themselves and the neighborhood, can lend themselves to easy misreading by those folks that are unfamiliar with rappers' use of uh, manipulation of identity both on and off the stage. Now this is particularly problematic with gangster rap, where artists take on a criminal persona and weave over the top embellished accounts of sexual conquest and criminal violence. If audiences don't appreciate that these are genre conventions, that this is the stuff of gangster rap, they can easily conflate artist with character and fiction with fact. And while one can find isolated examples of rappers that have real life connections to crime, and, and by the way, name one art form where you can't, <laughs> I argue that it would be a mistake to extend this generalization to rappers overall. Even casual fans of rap understand that just as in gangster films, horror novels, and even in pro wrestling. Exaggerated depictions of violence are the hallmark of gangster rap. If rappers were even responsible for the tiniest fraction of the violence that they portray in their music, I argue, we'd all be in really big trouble, a point I've emphasized when my writing and when I've been testifying in front of jurors. 
Now, unfortunately, judges and juries don't always understand this, and it's a point that either prosecutors share or choose to exploit. And in case after case, the results have been devastating for the accused. Nearly all are found guilty and sent off to prison. And social science research can help us understand why this happens. Experimental research routinely reveals biases in judgment and decision making that occur among individuals, including in the courtroom. Studies find that courtroom officials, whether we're talking about judges, attorneys, jurors, and others, all run the risk of, de of um, developing what's called confirmatory bias or the tendency to favor information that basically confirms our preconceptions or stereotype beliefs whether or not that information is true. And in the context of rap music in the courtroom, two studies, I argue, are particularly illustrative. Now in one study, a social psychologist devised an experiment to determine the impact that gangster rap lyrics might have on potential jurors. In, in this experiment, test subjects were presented with basic biographical information about an 18-year-old hypothetical African-American male, but only some of the respondents in the, in the experiment were shown a set of explicit rap lyrics that he had supposedly penned. Okay? All of the respondents were asked to evaluate the young man on a number of dimensions. So, for example, subjects were asked about the perceptions regarding the young man's personality. Is he caring or uncaring? Likeable, not likeable, um, selfish, unselfish, capable of murder, not capable of murder. What the researcher found was that the lyrics exerted a significant prejudicial impact on the test subjects. So you can see that there was a much more negative evaluation for those subjects that had been exposed to the rap lyrics compared to the group of subjects that hadn't been exposed to the rap lyrics. More importantly, though, the subjects who read the lyrics were significantly more likely to think that the man was capable of committing murder, simply because of the lyrics. In another study, a social psychologist devised an experiment in which she presented two groups of subjects with an identical set of violent lyrics. And it turns out they were violent lyrics from a folk song. Maybe some of you know the song. The lyrics read, well, early one evening, I was roaming around. I was feeling kind of mean. I shot a deputy down. Okay. <laughs> that, the, the chuckle maybe means some folks know that. This is a, a song from the 60s, I believe, Bad Man's Blunder. And uh, anyway, one group in the experiment was told that the lyrics came from a country song. The other group of subjects in the experiment was told they came from a rap song. Now, as the researcher hypothesized, and you can probably guess, the responses to the lyrics were much worse, much more problematic when the subjects believed that the lyrics were rap compared to country, revealing that the very same lyrical passage that is acceptable as country music is considered threatening and dangerous when represented as rap. Now, one could make the argument that this study is nearly 20 years old. And in fact, you'd be right. It was published in 1999, which is why I decided to recreate this study in 2016 to see if the findings still applied today. You know what I found? Not one thing had changed. Using the same experimental approach, the same lyrics, all of it, I found that I was able to replicate the findings of the 1999 study. And to take the study one step further, I asked the subjects in my experiment to rate the lyrics on three different dimensions. So first I asked respondents to tell me how threatening or dangerous they thought the lyrics were, how offensive, how threatening, how dangerous they were. I then asked them whether or not they thought the lyrics should be regulated, like banned from the radio or have a warning label associated with them. And then finally, I asked respondents in my experiment whether or not they thought the lyrics um, were literal or autobiographical. In other words, did they think the artist was actually living the lyrics that were written here? I found that when the lyrics were believed to be rap music, across the board, they fared far worse on all these dimensions compared to when they were believed to be country. Okay, so in 2016, why does any of this matter? Why should you, why should we care about rappers and rap lyrics? 
Well, putting rap on trial raises questions about the equal application of our First Amendment protections, <coughs> as well as the right of all citizens in this country to receive a fair trial. But it's more than that. In these cases, authorities are almost always prosecuting a young man of color, someone who already looms as a threatening stereotype in the minds of society. In nearly every case I've been involved in or know about, the individual being accused and put on trial is a young African American or Latino male. Using rap as evidence, then, is not just a matter of art being sacrificed for the sake of an easy conviction. Rather, the practice constitutes a pernicious tactic that plays upon and perpetuates enduring stereotypes about the inherent criminality of young men of color. Which brings me to my next point. This practice does not operate in isolation. It is one of a constellation of policies and practices that disproportionately impact people of color in the US today. These policies and practices, some intentional, others less so, are not just harmful in and of themselves, but they also serve to reproduce racial inequality in the United States with dire consequences. Let me elaborate for a minute. I want to talk for a few minutes here about neighborhoods. And I know it sounds like I'm taking you off on a completely different path, um, moving in a different direction. But stick with me for a minute. Now, real estate mantra tells us that three factors determine the market value of a home, right? Location, location, and location. I argue the same could be said about the factors that determine virtually any aspect of the good life and people's access to it in metropolitan America today. Access to decent housing, safe neighborhoods, good schools, and other resources and benefits is largely influenced by the community into which one is born, grows up, and currently resides. In essence, I argue, place matters. Neighborhoods count. Of course, individual intelligence, initiative, experience, and all the elements of human capital matter. No doubt about that. But understanding the opportunity structure in the United States today requires complementing with what we know about individual initiative and motivation and intelligence with what we are learning about place. Privilege, I argue, cannot be understood outside of the context of place. Now bring in race. Where one lives and one's racial background, both separately but also in interaction with one another, significantly shape the privileges or lack thereof that people enjoy. What we end up with then is an inextricable linkage among race, place, and privilege something I've thought long and hard about and have written on in my book, Privileged Places, Race, Residence, and the Structure of Opportunity. To concretize this point, I'd like you to consider the following statistics. These bar charts show average percentages for various socioeconomic characteristics, such as poverty, joblessness, professional workers, and college graduates, for neighborhoods of different colors in cities throughout the United States. So comparing predominantly white neighborhoods with predominantly African American, Latino, and minority neighborhoods. And these are national data. So this is the national portrait, if you will. The inequality in levels of poverty, joblessness, professional workers, and college graduates in predominantly white compared to predominantly African American, Latino, and minority neighborhoods is simply astonishing. As these figures reveal, white neighborhoods are especially privileged across all of these dimensions. For example, fewer than 10% of residents of white neighborhoods are impoverished. And levels of joblessness are relatively modest in white neighborhoods throughout the nation. At the same time, high status workers and college graduates are relatively prevalent in white communities. In contrast, average levels of low status characteristics are generally two to three times higher in African American, Latino, and minority neighborhoods throughout the United States. 
compared to white neighborhoods. And these neighborhoods do not enjoy similar levels of professional workers and college graduates. Now add to this place-based racial disparities in access to top-notch schools, the availability of health care, access to clean air and water, right and here we're thinking, I'm reminded of what, what's happening in Flint, and the ability to live in a relatively crime-free community, and it's easy to see why one leading sociologist has concluded the combination of urban poverty and family disruption concentrated by race is so strong that the worst urban contexts in which whites reside are considerably better than the average context of black communities. In sum, there are dramatic consequences for those living in areas with large concentrations of racial minorities. And one consequence that we examine in our book, Privileged Places, is exposure to crime and the likelihood of being caught up in the criminal justice system. Now, studies typically find that once released from prison, racial minorities are more likely to recidivate or reoffend, sending them back to prison, compared to whites. What the vast majority of these studies fail to account for, however, is the like, that the likelihood of recidivism may be linked to the very neighborhoods where ex-offenders are returning. And equally important, how such dramatic differences in neighborhood context, as I've been talking about just a second ago, may play a key role in helping to explain racial disparities in crime and recidivism. For most offenders, as well as for their families, re-entry back into society post-prison is a very complex process. Those just released from prison can struggle with substance abuse, inadequate education and job skills, limited housing options, and serious health and mental health needs. We know that family relationships are strained by incarceration. It should come as no surprise to us then that these individuals rely heavily on their neighborhoods, neighborhood resources and services which facilitate their reentry back into society and should help to curb recidivism. Now, this works perfectly well when ex-offenders return home to advantaged, resource-rich communities that have all of these services. But what happens when ex-offenders return to extremely disadvantaged, resource-poor neighborhoods? Are these communities able to offer the services and related economic opportunities that ex-offenders need? Or do they simply nurture further criminal activity? In this way, then, the race-place-privilege nexus may be perhaps most explicitly evident in our criminal justice system. And though crime and recidivism are often explained in terms of race, it may be more fruitful to consider how resource-poor neighborhoods facilitate crime and recidivism and what that means for race and racial inequality. Circling back around to the rap lyrics cases I was discussing earlier, by and large, these aspiring rappers come from the very impoverished, resource-poor neighborhoods I've been talking about today. Ironically, most of these men, when I talk to them and interview them and ask them about their career and their lives, they talk to me and say that they see rap as a way to get out of these impoverished neighborhoods, as their meal ticket out of the neighborhood. Of course, this is a, a sentiment that rappers have been rapping about for decades. Consider one of my favorite rappers, Notorious B.I.G. Uh, he's, he's a bit old school, so maybe some of you don't know who he is. <laughs> That's because I'm 45 and I'm stuck in the 90s. <laughs> but one of my favorite lyrics from Notorious B.I.G. is out of a song called Things Done Changed. And he raps in this, if I wasn't in the rap game, I'd probably have a key knee deep in the crack game because the streets is a shortstop. Either you're slinging crack rock or you got a wicked jump shot. Now in their own way, rappers have been talking about and have long recognized the limited resources and opportunities that characterize their communities. In light of all this, the question that I opened with, should your art send you to prison, is really only one of many questions that we should be asking ourselves. 
we should also be asking ourselves, how does putting rap on trial help to generate and reproduce racial inequality in the United States today? Thank you.